Through the 31 years that we practice law, there's been a few cases that are more interesting than others. I'd like to share those with you on this video. I'd like to go and uh, tell you a little bit about some of the cases that we're working on now to give you a flavor of our firm. We just worked on a craft brewery, a lease for a craft brewery. And it was interesting though, because it was with a big shopping center and we had to deal with their lease. Now, we couldn't go with our lease, but you know, our guy wants to get the deal done. There was a couple clauses in that that really bothered me and I'll talk about them a little bit later, but there's a non-disturbance clause that was very bothersome, that we had to have a non-disturbance clause because he was putting a lot of money into the building as was the landlord. But what we wanted to make sure is that if that uh, shopping center ever got foreclosed on by the landlord's bank, that that landlord, that that bank can't uh, kick them out. And they can without a non-disturbance clause. So we make sure we get a non-disturbance clause in these cases to protect that client. So that if it does get foreclosed on, he can continue his lease. Because that non-disturbance says, as long as you keep paying rent and honoring your terms of the lease, even the bank recognizes that you're right as ahead of the banks as far as that lease space. Another one we worked on recently is just an earnest money contract for a sale of a piece of property. And the reason that's important, it was an individual. So it's really important when you represent individuals that you protect them because anytime an individual, you're exposing yourself. She didn't have an attorney when she was first represented and therefore she didn't put it in an LLC. And that was a big mistake. So she's out there, so we have to make sure we put special clauses in there to protect her in case a lawsuit ever arises. And also we worked on an earnest money contract that was owner financed. A client of ours had a property he wanted to sell, and what we did, we did the full boat on that. We did the note, deed of trust, lien, uh, to protect him in case that person doesn't pay him with the selling, the selling price, because he took a note back. He took some cash, 25% down, the other 75% he owner financed. I like to talk about bank finance cases that we're working on now, collection cases. Again, that's 60% of our practice. We had a case that came from an attorney, and he had a judgment, tried to collect it for about two years, and struggled uh, getting it collected. He turned it over to us. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of the things interesting was that, as Jim Mulder would say, they made a big mistake because they had a corporation as the defendant. Instead, if that defendant had been, a, had been an LLC, it would have made my job a lot difficult, a lot, lot harder. Well, we went in and we had the sheriff go out and ask to turn over that stock, the shares, where if it was an LLC, they couldn't do that. We'd have to go get a charging order. So by them not having the right structure, we were able to get the sheriff to go out there and make him turn over his stock. The other thing we did was we noticed the deposition of his wife, the debtor himself, and his shareholder. So having three depositions coming up with a, somebody turning over the stock that we were gonna sell the stock, we got him to the table and we settled, we settled that case with a bunch up front of the judgment and then payment over like a five year period. The other part we did was uh, another case we handled just a couple weeks ago was a finance company out of Nebraska that we represent. And they have a lien on, uh, they have a hotel financing note. The guy threw the kitchen sink, he didn't wanna pay the note back. He took off to Wisconsin. We were able to get him to the table. It took a long time, but he realized we weren't going away, and he's agreed to make payments. We recently got a, a case in, well, we represent a student loan authority uh, out of Rhode Island, and we're hoping they're supposed to pay the next, either today or tomorrow, a big chunk of that student loan, about 90% of it. It's taken a couple of years to get him to the table, but we got him there. So that'll be hopefully found money for the client. I like student loan representation on the client side on the collecting edges because they don't have the exemptions that everybody else has and they can't go file bankruptcy. If they go file, they can file bankruptcy, but they're not gonna get rid of their student loan. So that's another asset we do. And recently I had a case, uh, been working on the last two days. The client had a judgment from 2009. We got it about a year, about six or eight months ago. And we've been really hard on this individual about collecting it. And we went and we've just asked him to uh, turn over all this discovery, produce all these documents, tax returns, because I think a lot's going through his wife. So finally, attorney called me yesterday and said he wants to settle because he's got four or five of these cases from, 19, from 2009. He goes, four of them have gone away. He goes, you keep on him and you won't let go. He goes, he's got to get rid of you. I said, that's fine. So we worked out a settlement. We're working on a settlement and hopefully get that closed within the next couple of weeks. And that's what we do. The difference in our firm and a lot of other firms is we keep coming after you because we know a lot of people, when they get a judgment, they don't know what to do with it. The attorney, they go get the abstract, they get the writ of execution, and that's it. 
But we take it to the next step, the next step, we're on steroids. And we just go keep going after them. We feel like we want to have them go with their, like I want their thinking my mouth is on their ankle and I'm not going to let go until I get some uh, blood out of them. No, until I get the money. <laughs>